The idea that cooking honey makes it somehow unfit for human consumption has been around for literally thousands of years, and it does have a scientific basis. But just because something has a scientific basis doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. In fact, the available science would seem to indicate this one probably isn't true. Cooking honey might deprive it of some of its more subtle flavors, and maybe some of its nutritional value, but it does not make it toxic. And understanding how an idea can have a scientific basis and yet still be wrong is a basic part of the scientific literacy to which all of us non-scientists should aspire. Honey, if heated or taken by a person suffering from heat, becomes fatal due to its association with poisons. That's according to the Charaka Samhita, an ancient Sanskrit text on the Indian traditional medicine system known as Ayurveda. Scholars believe it was first written down somewhere around 2,000 years ago. And you know, a lot can happen in a couple of millennia. I don't know, maybe that was actually true back then that heated honey would be fatal. But about 10 years ago, some researchers at India's Defense Food Research Laboratory did some experiments to see if heated honey really is toxic. At least, you know, nowadays. They got a couple of different kinds of honey. As everyone knows, honey comes in three basic types, raw, clear, and bare. That last one was a joke. Raw honey is just taken out of the beehive and then strained to remove any little bits of wax and bee parts that are in there, and that's it. It's widely believed that raw honey has various health benefits. It's an antioxidant, it fights infections, it's good for your cholesterol. But for what it's worth, the EU's Food Safety Authority, among other scientific bodies, considers those claims to be unsubstantiated by research. There's also a persistent belief that eating raw honey that was produced in your local area can help with seasonal allergies. By exposing you to small doses of pollen from your local ecosystem, thereby allowing you to become tolerant of them. This is indeed a proven treatment for seasonal allergies, but only when it's done with precisely formulated pharmaceutical injections, not with rando bee puke from around the block. You'll note this bottle prominently says Southeast on it. This is to tell me that it was made by bees in my region of the United States. The package designers don't realize that I've actually read the landmark 2002 study out of the University of Connecticut, which found no link whatsoever between local honey consumption and allergies as compared to a placebo. It remains the position of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology that there is no scientific proof that eating local honey will improve seasonal allergies. And in rare cases, there might actually be a risk. A risk that somebody with a really serious allergy could have their throat swell up and go into anaphylactic shock if they eat the wrong raw honey. Just because an idea has a scientific basis doesn't mean it's supported by the available science. Anyway, that's raw honey. Normal honey has typically been filtered a bit more aggressively to get rid of the slightest impurity and give you that clear look, and it's typically been pasteurized to kill some of the yeasts in there and therefore extend shelf life. By the way, that'll kill the botulism bacteria, but not their spores or their toxins. That's why babies aren't supposed to have any kind of honey. If you've eaten any normal mass market clear honey in your life, you have had cooked honey. Pasteurization equals heat. You've had cooked honey and you ain't dead yet. But just because something isn't acutely toxic doesn't mean it's not slowly killing you over a long time with repeated exposure. That's called chronic toxicity, and that's probably what those scientists in India were really looking for when they did their experiments. They took some raw honey and some pasteurized honey, and they subjected both to the same battery of tests. They heated it to 60 degrees Celsius, 140 Fahrenheit. That's at the low end of the temperatures at which honey might be pasteurized. They also heated it to 140 Celsius. That's 284 Fahrenheit. Really hot as far as sugar goes. And they held it there for a full two minutes. Let's see what honey looks, smells, and tastes like when it's that hot for two minutes. Now note that I have my thermometer on Celsius because we're doing science here, not cooking. As the temperature creeps up, nothing much happens until we near 100 degrees, otherwise known as the boiling point of water. Honey is about 20% water and out it comes. Oops, are we gonna need a bigger pot? No, thankfully. Some pretty unpleasant smells are starting to come off it and we've hit 140 Celsius, so T minus two minutes and mark. Oh, like my fancy new watch? 
It's courtesy of the sponsor of this video, Filippo Loretti. I don't think I've worn a watch since I got my first cell phone senior year of college. Yes, I am old, but I was also a late adopter. A holdout, really. Anyway, here's the problem with always using your phone as a watch. Odds are high you're going to check the time and then get immediately distracted by Instagram or something. A real watch just tells you the time. It doesn't suck your time. Also, real watches last forever, whereas my phone is at 1%. Filippo Loretti was started by a couple of brothers who didn't understand why beautifully designed watches had to be four or five figures. They do a direct-to-consumer business model that gets the price way lower. They're kind of the Warby Parker of watches, which is probably why my glasses match my watch so well. I got one for Lauren, the Marble Rose Gold Mesh. Watches are a classic gift item for a reason. And because you watch me, Philippa Loretti will give you up to 70% off your personalized watch, and then a $50 gift card for another order. Keep the watch and give away the gift card, or give them both away. Just use my link and code in the description. My watch, by the way, is the Ascari, which in addition to looking cool and classy as the Italian race car driver for which it was named, has a chronograph on it for precision timing. And indeed, two minutes is up. The honey looks and smells disgusting, which is not the same as being poisonous, though it sure tasted like it. Anyway, the researchers also mixed honey with equal quantities of ghee, Indian-style clarified butter. The Charaka Samhita warns, do not eat food with antagonistic qualities, such as equal amounts of honey and ghee. Yes, I made my own ghee. You boil the butter until the water is gone and the milk solids all sink to the bottom. That's clarified butter. Then you let the milk solids brown, giving a toasty flavor to all of the milk fat around it. That is ghee. You just strain it off, leaving the solids behind to be discarded. I'm sure that people do it lots of different ways, but that's the basic idea. Anyway, the researchers also mixed heated honey with heated ghee. Then they did a bunch of analysis on all of the resulting samples. The cooked honey was different in lots of ways. It was less dense, it was less acidic, it actually had more antioxidant activity, but here's the big difference. The cooked honey had way more HMF, hydroxymethylferferol. Nailed it. HMF is a byproduct of the Maillard reaction, the browning reaction that makes food worth eating and life worth living. In particular, it's formed by the dehydration of sugars that can happen at high heat. HMF occurs naturally in raw honeys, especially honeys produced in very, very hot climates. The honey literally cooks a little bit in the hive. But certainly cooking the honey some more results in more HMF, as these experiments proved. And HMF has been a compound of concern to scientists for some time because some in vitro experiments indicated that it might be carcinogenic. In vitro experiments are experiments done in like a test tube, not on a living organism like a lab rat or a person. Those are known as in vivo experiments, and in vivo experiments on HMF have been much less concerning. A few studies where they gave big doses of HMF to lab rats seemed to indicate a weak carcinogenic effect in the intestinal tract, but those findings were all but dismissed by these German scientists who published a very widely cited risk assessment of HMF in 2011. Their conclusion? No relevance for humans concerning carcinogenic and genotoxic effects can be derived. However, they did raise concern about the concentrations of HMF used in caramel colorings for foods. Those scientists in India fed their ghee and honey samples to rats for six weeks, and what did they find? Absolutely nothing compared to the control group. No differences in weight gain, no differences in their organs, bupkis. There is a reason to believe that HMF might be bad for you if you eat a ton of it, but sweetening a sauce with a squeeze of honey every now and then ain't gonna do it. Oh, and another thing. HMF is in everything. It's not just in honey. In particular, it's in roasted coffee, dried fruits, and wait for it, baked goods. There's tons of it in toast. You want to be worried about something vis-a-vis -vis honey? Be worried about this. Colony collapse disorder. This is the global trend in recent years of worker bees just piecing out, leaving their queen and babies behind. This is a phenomenon that endangers not only your honey habit, but all the crops you eat that honeybees pollinate, which is a lot. These bees I've been showing you live on the campus of Berry College, just north of where I live in Georgia. They're happy bees. They're looked after by Berry student Shelby Koch. It's kind of funny being the beekeeper around here. You know, you walk out of lunch after after classes and then you're like, oh yeah, you know, there are my girls foraging in the holly next to the science building or whatever, you know? And they don't just eat landscaping nectar, they eat a varied diet of wildflowers and clover. One theory as to what's driving colony collapse disorder is monoculture. Bees feeding off of these large-scale agricultural operations with just one crop in them. Kind of like, you know, 
vegetables are great for you, but if you only ever ate vegetables and like didn't get any source of protein from anything, you, pr you probably wouldn't be doing as well. And it's kind of the same idea with bees. And so I've seen people cite that as an issue. But Koch says nobody really knows what's doing this. Could be a lot of things. Fungicides negatively impacting uh, symbiotic fungi within the hive. Um, there's large concern over um, large-scale pesticide usage. Eesh, well, I'm glad she's working on it. I don't really have much for you here other than to say that if you want to be worried about something having to do with honey, be worried about that. And be aware that our choices as food consumers might be a causal factor. But yeah, cook your honey. It's fine.